us Um, it looks strange to us because this is a Native American word. I don't know which tribe that was, but that's this is their direct name for it that was held over. Somebody give me one really cool trivia about Pipsisawa, a legend that most of you allegedly experience this herb in some way every day. You know, the story goes that nobody knows if it's still in there or not, but the one of the original flavor profiles for Pepsi was because it had Pepsisua as one of its base ingredients. I don't know to this day if that's still in there or they just have artificial flavorings. Right, it's kind of surprising when you research Coca-Cola and some of these things, there's a lot of secrets there still, even in the age of disclosing things on the label, that pretty interesting history, right? Like Coca-Cola still has coca leaves in it, right? Where cocaine comes from, yep. And they buy it and they, a place in New York City where it is the cocaine compounds are removed. If you were isolated, we'd be in trouble. I'll just say that. But they have all these, yeah, exemptions and corporate lawyers to help them <laughs> figure this out. Um, but yeah, they use D, it's called decocoized coca leaves. So a lot of these old pops and colas have interesting history. So I don't know if it's still in the flavoring. I don't know. Or if it's just all truly artificial now. But allegedly, the original Pepsi formulas had Pepsisla as like a flavoring agent. That shouldn't surprise us, right? Because all these, how did Coca-Cola and Pepsi and Dr. Pepper all these started? Like kind of, most of them started for health tonics. Most of them actually started for syphilis treatments because that's always been a huge thing in the world since ancient times right so we do use pipsisola for stds and things like syphilis so uh, it's always been used for that historically yeah yeah a lot of people it's the real real deal right just like everything else, there's super syphilis strains out now that are resistant to antibiotics. Yeah, I just had a client that, um, yeah, this is kind of interesting. I guess I could say this, I'm not disclosing names or anything. Um, cheated on their partner and uh, <laughs> only found that out because he contracted a rare form of syphilis that made him go blind. And it took the med center like almost a week, not like almost blind, like a week to figure it out. And he had full recovery, but yeah, not like a room you'd want to be in, right? So um, it happens. It's still around. It does weird things to people for sure. Okay. Okay, so Pipsisua, I'll pass this around. It's kind of a funky little herb. It is, I forgot to pull a picture of it up. Um, it's one of the weirdest looking plants out there, right up there with scout cabbage. Never really seen it live much in my life. It grows in the pine forest. Let's see if I can find a picture. Not a very big plant, so the fact that um takes a lot of Pipsisola to get this amount. So what we pay for, it's really cheap. It just looks like a really funky alien plant kind of to me. But it's not very tall. It's not like a huge plant. 
grows, I think, in the pine forest. It has to have like a real, I think, acidic pine environment for it to grow. Really interesting. Okay, what's unique about Pipsisola? is that it's one of our few herbs that is an, it is an alternative, one of our special herbs to the lymph, but especially to the kidney and bladder. This is where it really excels when we remember this. So what does that mean to us as practitioners that this is a alternative to the kidney or bladder. What is, how are we going to use this? So it is literally cleansing to the kidney and bladder, like truly, but not only cleansing, but because it's an alternative, we're going to have that deeper, deep tissue cleansing action in and around the kidneys and all the lymph in and around the kidneys and all the deep tissues in and around the kidneys. Um, so because of that, it's good for any kind of chronic kidney or bladder problem. And it's also good for any kind of kidney bladder cancer, any kind of growth in the kidney or bladder like kidney cyst, kidney non-cancerous tumors, um, bladder lining tum tumors. Um, it's an alternative. So we also use this herb a lot after people have had a cystoscope. So you've been to the urologist as a guy or a girl and you get the really uncomfortable procedure of having the scope poked through your ureter and into your bladder. Uh, and every time you get a cystoscope, remember it creates scar tissue. So the more people have to have them, especially if you have like the history of bladder cancer and they have to go in like every six months or so to look at it, you're just like re-aggravating all those tissues. So I have found just through my own experience that for chronic problems and irritation just from being scoped so much in your ureter or bladder, this is like a really good remedy. And usually we combine it with marshmallow for that to soothe the ureter and the lining of the bladder. Okay. So this, because it's an alternative, this also means we're going to use this for really chronic low-grade problems with the kidney or bladder, like literally everything. You have bladder pains that are chronic. Nobody knows why, right? You have chronic kidney stones, bladder stones. You've had to pass stones that are really big, and it created a lot of irritation. Um, you have chronic lower back pain from like kidney bladder problems. You have um, elevated kidney function labs, meaning your kidneys are inflamed for some reason, right? For example, your BUN is elevated, your creatinine is elevated. So if you've had a lot of UTIs and you're still having weird urinary stuff afterwards, just like with the antibiotic, this is one of those herbs I actually give people when they're getting an antibiotic for UTI because we're trying to clear the inflammation out. Now, the antibiotic just kills the bacteria, but this actually can get the inflammation out. So that's why a lot of people have a bladder infection, get an antibiotic, which kills the bacteria but all the inflammation is still there. 
And then those pockets of inflammation just get reinfected right away again. Yeah. Uh huh. Doctor, and with the test showing the cancer out of the urine, they're proceeding with the colonoscopy, urine, um, however irritates the skin so much that we've had to make diaper rash cream. This is very bad for everyone. Any information about? Yeah, well, yeah, I don't. I'd have to think about that more. It'd be kind of complex, but. In general, when especially the elderly people um, or people that have chronic bladder problems can get like a rash from their urine being like too irritated or acidic or inflamed. Um, Pipsisla was one of the main things we use to help with that. So it would be something to consider. Mm -hmm. So, but I don't know about exactly what you're talking about, Lasagna. I'd have to you have to email me about that. I'd have to think about it. Mm -hmm. So, what's also unique about Pipsisla? So, we're going to use this for any kind of when people get chronic UTIs and bladder problems, people that have lower back aches from kidney problems or bladder problems. This is what we use. Um, and in fact, when people do cleanses that have Pipsisla in them, they can have temporarily a little achy back with this herb because it does cleanse the kidneys so strongly. That being said, it is safe to use with kidney disease. We don't use it with someone that has had a kidney transplant because we don't know if it does anything in that situation, but we can use it when people have kidney disease. It's safe, it can be helpful. Okay. Um, it helps the kidneys filter all the water soluble compounds out of the body. But what's unique about this plant is that it is a little bit of a tonic too. So it actually does strengthen and tone the bladder. In fact, oftentimes I'll put this in adaptogen formulas as a little bit of a kidney bladder tonic. If someone says they have, we use this herb a lot for incontinence. We use this a lot for dribbling, like urinary dribbling. We use this a lot for men too, which we'll talk about. Um, stones, for people that have chronic kidney or bladder stones, this is one of the main herbs to help flush those acids and things out of the system long-term. The eclectic said it's specific for mucopurulent bladder and vaginal discharge. What the heck does that mean? So this is means like where your bladder is probably so infected or you've had some kind of a bladder cancer surgery and you're discharging a lot of like pus, mucus. This also means like a lot of STDs will do this too, like chlamydia and um, syphilis and all these chronic STDs will sometimes cause people to have like discharges like that. So this is, yeah, used historically for sexually transmitted diseases, like more like just syphilis and chlamydia. Okay. We also use it for bladder ulcers. Any kind of pain or discomfort in the bladder, it's also used for blood in the urine, pus in the urine. Um, like Lasagna is saying, we use this for itching and pain around the urethra, the skin around where the urine is going to exit the body. This is also considered a great tonic for 
elderly people for a weak bladder or kidney. So, okay. It is also an alternative, we said, and it also cleanses the lymph. So anytime we have, a lot of times when people have chronic UTIs or interstitial cystitis, all the lymph glands of the pelvic bladder area can be inflamed and swollen. So this is like, this targets the lymph of the bladder. So, so again, we use this for bladder cancer, bladder tumors. We also use this for testicular cancer, testicular tumors. Um, for men, this is one of the great tonics for prostatitis. Um, I forgot to say, it's also good for thick urine. So it is a prostatitis remedy. So remember, we have like benign prostate swelling that happens with the aging process with men. This is helpful for, but it's also good for prostatitis, which is like infection of the prostate, which can happen for a number of reasons and sometimes no known reason. Uh, can be a real chronic problem with men. We also use this for prostate cancer. I use this a lot after men have had their prostate removed. This is a really good herb to like tone the whole prostate bladder area and lymph. This actually can affect the lymph around the prostate too. So it's just a really amazing prostate herb for men. It's historically used for women for mastitis. I've never used it that way because it is a little bit of a lymph tonic. Um, it would also be used for any type of vaginal discharge, whether it's from an infection, surgery, cancer, tumor. Anytime there's going to be discharge, it's been used historically too. The taste of it's kind of Pepsi-like, right? Once that's in the back of your mind. Can you kind of taste the Pepsi a little bit? A little bit? Definitely needs <laughs> more sugar. Yeah, energy, definitely downward. Um, direction, I'm sorry, energy is definitely cooling, very cooling. Um, energy direction is downward, without a doubt. So this goes directly, you can probably feel it in your bladder and kidney already. Um, I think there's a lot of potential uses for this, like I said, in adrenal formulas, because this to me, and I take this herb, I do feel like it really strengthens like your core. So we should probably be using it more for like pelvic floor pain and disorders too. I use this a lot in women after like when they need a bladder lift or they've had a bladder lift. Okay. For men, like we talked about the antibiotics, getting back to that same theme, Oftentimes, men, doctors are just going to give you antibiotics for the prostatitis. Uh, the success rate is not very high. The urologists will tell you that because it's one of those chronic things some men get. Um, so you can take this with an antibiotic for prostatitis or before and after. You take it long term to help prostatitis. It's also allegedly a hair tonic. There's an old history of this. That should make sense to us through what connection? It's good for the kidney. So it probably has some effect on the hair, right? It was taken internally for hair growth, but I would probably say that's just going to be better for people that are losing their hair because of chronic kidney bladder problems. Okay, but it is an herb that begs to just be used more and understood more. Um, 
I just I use it a lot for chronic bladder problems and prostate problems. I'm just always super impressed with it. It's very gentle too. Very safe for kids and adults and the elderly too. So I'll pass it around. The tea itself it smells pleasant, it smells Pepsi E like. Yeah. Everybody knows all the secret chemistry of the colas too, right? Do you know another secret about Pepsi? Pepsi has these, um, and did this really cool lecture once from this chemist that used to work for the cola industry. Um, Pepsi, according to chemist, has trace amounts that aren't going to show up on most tests of progesterone in it. So people who crave Pepsi, they're actually, they have learned through this world of secret marketing and flavor science and everything that people often who or have progesterone deficiencies will crave Pepsi. You wanna know the other two? Dr. Pepper has testosterone derivatives. So often people that are deficient in testosterone will crave Dr. Pepper. It's like this very like a micro, I don't wanna say extremely trace amounts. They've figured out how to get it in there and it doesn't have to be disclosed on the label. And allegedly, uh, Coca-Cola would be estrogen. There's like trace amounts of estrogen-like molecules that somehow feed into these cravings we have for these products. So it's pretty cool. I don't know what compounds they're doing or if they're actually derivatives or they're more similar in structure or function but yeah they have figured this out and put them in things so so the only contraindication for pipsis was if someone's had a kidney transplant we don't know what to think about it yeah or obviously if somebody has like severe stage four end of life kidney disease we probably wouldn't use it unless they were getting their kidney function tested all the time. But people like that are going to be probably in a nursing home or hospital. So, yeah, but it's, it works fine with dialysis in that too. So there's never been any reported concerns with dialysis in that. It's a really cool herb. It really is. It's the main herb. To me, it's the main herb with Stalingia in our kidney bladder cleanse that makes it really special because it's got that alterative property and it cleanses the lymph like in the bladder area. So it's a pretty cool herb. Fortunately, you can't find it. You can only find it as a tea or a tincture. Uh, the tea works decent. The fresh plant tincture um, is what is considered the gold standard, but a tincture from the dried plant is good too. When you drink this, if your kidneys are fairly toxic, your urine will smell a little funky in a couple hours. It's like a good sign. You got a lot of acids and stuff in your body that needs to be flushed out. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, any other questions on Pip Siswa? I have used it alone rarely, but mostly always in formulas. Yeah. So like for chronic kidney problems with women, like where they have interstitial cystitis, I'll combine it with agrimony. And men that have like chronic prostatitis will combine it with other prostate tonics, kind of just like generic salt pimento in that. Um, and if there's a lot of lymph bladder things and deeper bladder issues, um, we'll usually combine it with stilingia. It's really dive down deep. 
Okay. Any questions on Pipsis? Anybody getting else? Anything else from it? Anything in your body feel just lower back, kidney? Yeah. Do you taste Pepsi? Do you get any? What's that? It is like a slight Pepsi, like, yeah. I could see where the original formula might have maybe started with that or something. I don't like that. I know it tastes gross to me. I don't like Pepsi and Sandwich when I drink it. So when I drink it, I don't find it good. Or is that completely unrelated? Uh, that said, that food scientist that I talked to would possibly say it could just be because you don't have, you know, progesterone deficiency or something. Yeah, but it could be. There's a lot of artificial colors and flavors in it. It could be something like that. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. You just have to get Virgil's root beer then. That's a good. That's a good. You do that one. Is that safe? Yeah, that's that's okay though. It works for you. Yeah, it's dark, but it there's no artificial anything in it. Uh, just from the herbs that are in it, it actually has like sarsaparilla and sassafras. Yeah, it's just a really real herbal root beer. Yeah, Virgil's root beer, my favorite. They actually have a stevia one that's zero calorie. It's really good. Zevia, because of the um, the sugar like thing they put in it, I get really upset stomach from it. The what do they put in it? Xylitol or mm, they have something else in it that's like a fake sugar alcohol. Because I can't drink it, and I love the idea of it, but it makes me like super upset stomach right away. But it's a great idea. Well, somebody have a label of Zevia. You're talking about the pops, right? The natural pops. Yeah. Yep. And my kids, it bothers them too. It's uh, what is the label? Uh, let's see here. Zevia. There we go. It's got one of the sugar alcohols. Maybe they took it out. Oh, uh, this one has none in it, but there's some of some of them are like um if you get this app, Bobby approved app, some of the Zevias are thumbs up and some of them are thumbs down. Maybe some of them have the uh... Yeah. Uh, they might have changed their flavor around because this one I'm looking at doesn't have that anymore. I mean, the thing is, too, like when when people on the label it says natural flavors, like that's highly dubious. That could be 47. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. But yeah, I don't see it on the label here. Black cherry one has a leaf. Erythritol, yeah, that's the thing in there that bothers me. Yeah, it still has stevia though, I think too, doesn't it? And it has, that's like their calling card, but it has erythritol. Yeah, everybody knows this compound, I cannot do. E, re, I think it's spelled like this. Erythritol, is that right? How do you spell that? E-R-Y-T-H-R-I-T-O-S. Close. Erythritol. Yeah. Um, I also cannot do the other sugar alcohol um, that's in all the keto stuff. Xylitol. Uh, there's xylitol, but there's another one. It's like the monk fruit thing, but it's the chemical from it. I think it is erythritol. And like birch xylitol, people don't don't know that can kill your pet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 
but Virgil's sugar-free is just herbs that make a root beer flavoring and stevia. Uh, believe it or not, Gatorade has actually a healthy Gatorade now. That's uh, it's hard to find. I forget what it's called, but it's like there. Uh, so no sugar added, no artificial colors or flavors, and it just has stevia, no erythritol or anything. So that's what I get when I'm at the gas station on a trip or something now, like my splurge. Yay! <laughs> get something. Okay. Okay. Um, so Pipsiswa. Anytime we have swollen lymph glands in the groin or pelvic area. So that's the last thing I want you to know about. Okay. Any questions on Pipsisawa? I'll tell you what's even better than Virgil's, but it has sugar. Is there's a Snake River sarsaparilla made in Wyoming of oh, this? It has real sassafras because when you just you can smell it when the bottle opens, it is divine. From the brewery, I think so. Yeah, yeah. You can find it occasionally, like at little at the grocery store if you look really hard. Occasionally. Okay, so some zevias do not have erythritol. Some of them do. Okay. Yeah, there's there's a really big debate about erythritol because I mean it just gives a lot of people stomach ache because it's like a the sugar alcohols are non-digestible. They're natural because they occur in a few plants in nature, but it's pretty trace amounts. I think I calculated once. Because like a lot of keto products will have like five, 10, <laughs> like 15,000 milligrams of erythritol, which is like, I think we calculated like one gram is about, you'd have to eat like 30,000 pounds of dates to get that. So it occurs in nature technically, but like in extremely trace amounts. So no one would ever eat like a gram. So but it just makes a lot of people gassy and bloated. And can really actually, there's some newer research that it's got some other potential health side effects too. So, so I don't, I don't personally use it. I can't, I just get ill from it. 